The scenes you are about to see are more incredible than anything today's science or fiction ever imagined. from another time and another place begins. Disbelief will be shattered and the truth of an ancient past will be revealed. When it occurs, you will see men turned killers by mysterious power. I wanted to kill you. Why? Because you are different. The women will be defiled by the invaders from outer space. It's Barbara. She's the one. Scientists will vainly attempt to save civilization. My duty now is to quieten public alarm. And you, you keep your damn paws out of things! It could happen in your lifetime. Ah! See it before it's too late. Welcome back to Geek Channel 8. I'm Eric. And I'm John. Today we're talking about Quartermass in the Pit, also known as Five Million Years to Earth from 1967 Hammer Horror Film. But before we get into that, I notice you are wearing a t-shirt that says The Time Machine. Now we're an audio podcast, so you can't see the video on this, (laughs) and that's intentional. (laughs) <laughs> like we actually record video but we don't share it with you guys because i figure you guys the last thing you want to see is our ugly mugs yeah there's you really don't want to see mine either <laughs> although the few that i've released to youtube as videos have done phenomenally better than our audio podcast so oh really yeah i gotta get my lighting set up better then <laughs> i'm just against the whole idea anyway back to the what we're, i was saying John is wearing a Time Machine t-shirt, and I wanted to find out if this was the reboot or the original. Oh, no, this is Back to the Future. It's my DeLorean. Okay, it is It is the specs for a DeLorean, so it's not yes. the Time Machine movie. <laughs> no, 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 it's... <laughs> oh. I am wearing... Nice, your vintage 60s Batman logo t-shirt, but in, but in kind of the gray and black, like uh, more of the modern Batman. Yeah, yeah, and... You know, I'm saying this the weekend that The Flash is opening. Mm-hmm. Now, The Flash is a bit of a disaster. Mm-hmm. It stars a... Mm-hmm. It stars an actor who is one of my neighbors here in Vermont. Really? Ezra Miller. Oh, okay. And um, Ezra is a bit of a challenge for Warner Brothers, to the point where they're not even attaching his name anywhere they're advertising the cameos by ben affleck and michael keaton and stuff more than they are have you read all the cameos that are actually in it like 
No, nor do I really want to. I, I could spoil it really quickly if you want. No, no spoilers, please. I'll get around <laughs> to it someday. But but I don't know how spoiled it could actually be. So this is their attempt to do a multiverse of madness kind of thing, because now they got to introduce a multiverse so that they can launch an entire... They're basically stealing Marvel's playbook. Pretty much. They've got to become successful. They've changed their CEO, new CEO. They changed Uh, their chair of the Warner Films. mm -hmm. There were six different directors for this film. They sunk $200 million into it, which is a jaw-dropping amount of money. Not only that, but the head of DC Cinematic Universe also switched hands as well. The, the people that are, like, in the in charge of things, far beyond the dire- simply the director and producers, like, it's amazing the movie's even released. <laughs> and we already talked about how they're bleeding out on their um, streaming service, now called Max. Yeah. <laughs> so this movie, it, you know, it's not as much as Justice League, which is like 300 million, but they, they sunk <laughs> 200 million into this film. We're on the Sunday of the opening weekend. As of right now, it has grossed 70 million. Uh, yep. It might, it just might have nine figure losses. That is very likely. Oh my God. That is enough to sink a studio. So we will see what (laughs) happens here. So I'm looking at the numbers on uh, the numbers.com. It has uh, the opening weekend for both domestic and international International, it didn't even make a dent. This may be as of Friday. It says domestic box office as of Friday, twenty-four point five million. International box office, four hundred and twenty-seven thousand. Oof, that hurts. Yeah. Ouch, big time. <laughs> so, before we get into quartermass in the pit, I need to do a segment on this show we call "Correcting the Record." Oh, okay. Michael Klein, who is the admin of the Films of the Fabulous 50s Facebook group, which is pretty cool. I suggest everybody go check it out. He said that he noted several errors during the discussion, Uh i.e. neither Cheney was in Freaks and the Quartermass Experiment came out in 1955. But I thought I should point out that Plan 9 was originally shot before The Black Sleep. Was it? I want to tackle each of these things in order because part of this is our bad. Part of this is not our bad. Yeah. Okay. So neither Cheney was in Freaks. This was a legitimate mistake. Yes. I said that Cheney was in Freaks. Lon Cheney was cast in Freaks, but he died while it was still in pre-production. Oh. He was not actually in the film, but he was part of the um, original conception of the film working alongside Todd Browning. Okay. Okay was originally uh, supposed to be in it. But okay, so that's kind of our bad. All right. The second thing Michael Klein pointed out is that the quarter mass experiment came out in 1955. Okay. We're aware of this, of course, because we made a whole podcast about the quarter mass experiment. (laughs) Yeah, it's always fun going through UK and US release dates. (laughs) This is a casual podcast. I don't have all these dates in front of me all the time, so I may have misspoke the date. That's completely possible. Or it may be because this was from the Black Sleep episode that I mentioned this. And even though it was released in the UK on August 26, 1955, we're talking about the US release on the double bill with the Black Sleep, which because mm-hmm. we were talking about the Black Sleep. Right. So that was April 26, 1956 according to the IMDb, which is kind of our go-to for facts about release dates. Right. Okay. Finally, he said that uh, I should point out that Plan 9 was actually shot before The Black Sleep. 9 was simply released quite a while after The Black Sleep, so could not have used footage from the other film. The footage we see of Bella in Plan 9 was taken by Ed Wood for a proposed horror western, The Ghoul Goes West, but it was mostly filmed just for the fun of it and how Bella would look in the film, unquote. Okay, so that's what Michael tells us. This one we're definitely wrong on, and we appreciate Mr. Klein pointing it out. So here's what happened here. I knew that Lugosi footage was shot for The Black Sleep, but not used. And I knew that Plan 9 came out after this and contained unused footage from Lugosi's quote-unquote previous film. So I made the supposition that this was that footage. 
But since Plan 9 was made but unreleased before The Black Sleep, it was Lugosi's previous unreleased film before this, The Ghoul Goes West, which also happened to be with Ed Wood, which begs the question, where is the unused footage of Lugosi from The Black Sleep? You know, and and it's funny because Ed Wood is one of my all-time favorite movies, and to hear the name The Ghoul Goes West... It just reminded me of that scene when uh, Johnny Depp was pitching the movies to the producer, and that was one of the titles he dropped. I was like, oh my god, that was an Easter egg this whole time. I had no idea. (laughs) There's another horror western that features Dracula in the Old West called Billy the Kid vs. Dracula. I either watched it and completely forgot about it, or never really made it through. I can't remember Aww. which, but uh, <laughs> it exists. So I don't know if that was inspired by, or we throw out these suppositions on the show all the time. Perhaps that was spi- inspired by The Ghoul Goes West, but I have no <laughs> idea. You know, and we rely on listeners to write in and tell us because we're not going to sit here and Google check everything. Right. We'd be sitting here on Google all the time. That's one of the reasons I've instituted the magic eight ball for question answers <laughs> to questions we don't know. Oh, um, I, I have something similar. Um, it is, let's see if I can hold this up here. It is a decision maker. Ah, cool. And it doesn't quite work in this position, but I could just like spin it and whatever it lands on, like, you know, pass the buck, reorganize tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> Uh, we're very into the Magic 8-Ball on this show because uh, we have ties to a place called Cincinnati, Ohio, where the Magic 8-Ball was invented. So, it was? Yeah. How have I lived here and never known this? Because you don't listen to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> See, okay, maybe I, I, I should start just cause, so I can learn these little things. My God, you'd think I would have known this. Yeah, I think I mentioned it in one of the Wednesday podcasts. Okay. Okay. All right. I think we've beaten around the bush enough as it is. Let's get into talking about the third Quartermass film, Quartermass mm-hmm. and the Pit. Yep. Sorry, Quatermass and the Quatermass. Pit. I'm going to try really hard to say it that way. <laughs> so let's go in a little bit into the history here. During World War II, the German Luftwaffe extensively bombed Britain, particularly London, dropping about 40,000 long tons of bombs during the Blitz. This led to a housing shortage. To rectify this, there were a number of government initiatives to build new towns, as they were called, such as we saw in Quatermass 2, if you remember, the enemy from space. It also led to extensive reconstruction of London itself. This reconstruction posed a problem. Following the end of the Second World War, a large number of unexploded ordnance from the Blitz have been found in the UK. This represents an ongoing hazard to this day, with two bombs found by construction workers so far in 2023, one of which exploded while attempting to defuse it. So It's still an ongoing problem. This is still an ongoing... Think about how, how long ago that was, and this is still an ongoing problem. Thank God. Thanks, Germany. So, October 20th through 21st of 1952, following a state emergency in Kenya, British authorities execute Operation Jock Scott, a mass arrest of suspected Mau Mau leaders in Kenya, which was a pivotal moment leading to the decade-long Mau Mau Rebellion, one of Britain's quote-unquote dirty colonial wars. Mm. July 26, 1956, Egypt seizes sole control of the Suez Canal. August 29th, 1958, the Notting Hill race riots break out following a summer of increased attacks on black people in the UK, including another ongoing race riot that began a week earlier in the city of Nottingham. December 22nd, 1958, Quatermass and the Pit premieres on BBC TV. And then... Almost a decade later, November 9th, 1967, Quatermass and the Pit is released in theaters in the UK. How did we go from Quatermass films coming out the same year or within a year of the TV serials and a decade long between Quatermass and the Pit, the TV series, and Quatermass and the Pit, the Hammer horror film? 
You know, as we were talking about uh, studio heads changing and everything and how fragile the existence of contracts and everything is, that actually kind of fits in quite well with uh, what happened. We can also thank The Curse of Frankenstein being a bigger hit the same year that Quartermass 2 came out because that began Hammer and Columbia Pictures' focus primarily on the gothic horror franchise. And when Neil actually wrote the first draft, when he finally felt comfortable to write the first draft of the script, it was 1961. Like, that's when he felt like, okay, let me turn this in. And Columbia even passed on it because they said they were no longer interested in Quatermass films. So the script was in development hell until 1964 when Columbia's final rejection of the script came around the same time that the relationship between Columbia and Hammer Films kind of dissolved. It went from being in development hell to being in development development hell, in a sense. Right. And since American co-financiers just didn't have any interest after this, they wanted to have Hammer do more got the core, it took a long time for them to actually get any more interest until, in 1966, Hammer would enter a new distribution deal with distributors, Seven Arts, APBC, which is the Associate British Picture Corporation, and 20th Century Fox. That became the moment where they went, sure, let's work on uh, another Quatermass film, and Neil began more drafts. Uh, the film wouldn't go into production until, you ready for this? February 27th, 1967. Wow. Yeah. Through April 25th, which I even did the math, that's 42 calendar days of shooting. Imagine that. Wrapping on April 25th of 1967, and then being released in November of 1967. Wow. Yeah, not a lot of time for your... Your editors, composers, and sound mixers, but yeah, that that is a tremendous turnaround. They wanted to get Val Guest back to direct, but because of the continued delays and everything, he became contractually obligated to other projects and wasn't able to direct this one. So it went to the director of A Night to Remember, director Roy Ward Baker, who was chosen due to his experience with technically demanding productions. So, kind of makes sense. Uh, this would turn out to be the first of six films that Baker would make for Hammer Films. Screenwriter Nigel Neal also finally got his opportunity to replace Don Levy as Quatermass, since so much time had passed between productions. So the role of Quatermass would go to Scottish actor Andrew Keir, who had just previously been in Hammer's Dracula Prince of Darkness the previous year. Keir would be on record to say that he felt director Roy Ward Baker wanted Kenneth Moore, who was in The Longest Day and A Night to Remember. Uh, Baker would also go on to note that he had no idea Keir was unhappy during filming. So, I've actually been on set and seen kind of like this disconnect between an actor and director before, where both of them are giving their all, they're both very talented, and for some reason they just don't connect for whatever reason. Right, right. It's plausible that they're both coming from a place of uh, honesty, just, and also with just such a, you know, quick you know, production time, like, they probably didn't have time to just stop and say, check in, it's like, hey, you're doing okay, or hey, I really like the performance, or hey, this is really cool. But, yeah, they probably were just rushing between every performance. Right. Uh, the budget was 275,000 pounds, which roughly came around to be about 5.8 million in today's U.S. currency, which is strange, making a movie for 42 days at a budget of $5.8 million. Um, and due to the lack of space at the Hammer Home, where they would usually film all the stuff, uh, filming actually ended up taking place at MGM British Studios in Elstree. Hammer regular production designer, uh, Bernard Robinson, uh, decided to add posters of other Hammer films. If you look closely, you can see posters for The Reptile, Dracula Prince of Darkness, and even The Witches into some of the set dressing for the Hobbs End Station special effects supervisor Les Bowie, was on board to handle some of the effects, which included a scene where there was a mixture of puppets and actual locusts to incorporate the effect, which I don't want to get into too much before we start talking about the film, so I'll leave it at that. Actor Julian Glover performed all of his own stunts, including the scene where Colonel Breen falls over into the pit. 
composer Tristan Carey was requested by producers to actually score orchestral as well as electronical scores so they could choose which ones they wanted to use for scenes. So you'd have certain scenes where it was orchestral and other scenes where it was more electronic, and this was done by design. And according to Fox Records, the film required $1.2 million to break even, but only made 881000 or roughly $5.54 million in today's currency. So I guess it was still sort of seen as being profitable, but I think this would also explain why we have such a long gap between the next film as well. I want to talk a little trivia about Quatermass. Remember, Quatermass has the uh, is in charge of the British Rocketry Group. Ministry of Rocket. No, I don't think it's a ministry. It's, it's, but not, it's, it's not uh, quite a ministry yet. Yeah. You know, we had talked about the British space program before, so I have a question for you: the British Interplanetary Society (BIS) for short is the first organization to support and promote astronautics and space exploration in the world. When was it founded? Hmm. I'm probably going to guess 1969, 68, 69. No, the answer is nope. It was, oh. this was the first, so it, it couldn't be recently, right? It has to predate NASA mm, and all okay. that, right? Oh, okay, yeah. It was founded in Liverpool in 1933 by Philip E. Cleeter. Hmm. 34 years before this film. In the 1930s, they were already talking about British rocketry. Like, hmm. okay. Second, when was the first British rocket launched? I'd probably say it'd be during Restoration. So it'd have to be after the war. Probably, I'd say, early 50s? No, no. No. The 27th of June, 1969, two years after wow. this film. So, so the Quatermass films actually, like a lot of good science fiction, uh, predate <laughs> or predict stuff that came later. Yep. So let's get into breaking down this film. It opens with the construction of an extension to the London Underground at mm -hmm. Hobbs End, and it unearths a humanoid skull. And there's a archaeologist, Dr. Matthew Roney, who's called in, and he estimates the skull's age at about 5 million years old, making it the oldest hominid find yet. So to begin with, Right at the beginning, we have a character, Dr. Roney, who's almost like the protagonist of this story. Like, I think mm -hmm. he ends up having more screen time than Quatermass. <laughs> it does seem that way, yeah. Especially in the beginning. A couple of things I want to say about this scene is the workman who breaks through to find the skeleton. Mm -hmm. That actor is Gareth Thomas. He would go on to play Raj Blake in the BBC science fiction show Blake 7. Oh, Okay. So he's Blake. Okay. This came out in 1967. In 1974, okay, so after this film, the fossil remains of hominid Lucy that everybody knows about from school. Oh, okay. Australopithecus afarensis was found in Ethiopia. Hmm. So Lucy and this other one were found and dated at about 3.1 million years old. In the 90s and the 2000s, more hominid fossils have been found dating four to six million years or older. So again, accidental accuracy, right? Right. At the time, that was considered, nah, there are no, you know, that's way too old. The oldest one was, you know, one million or whatever. But since then, we found that, yeah, in fact, and I've seen the skull of these older ones from the four to six million range. And they look just like the skull from this movie. <laughs> That's not the only thing they find. They find a metallic object nearby. They hit a metallic object and work is put on hold because they fear it's an unexploded bomb from the Blitz. Yeah. So they call the army. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there's this British army officer, Colonel Breen, mm -hmm. and he's been assigned to oversee Quartermass's 
British Experimental Rocket Group. I like that better than BIS. Much to Quartermass's chagrin, this guy's in charge. The military has been put in charge of his science rocketry group. This is so military. <laughs> Remember the colonization of the moon plan from, oh, yeah. from the last film? Yep. Apparently the British army plans to use the colonization of the moon plan to establish a ballistic missile base in space. Then when the bomb disposal team calls for Breen's assistance with this metal object they found at Hobbs End, mm-hmm. he happens to be with Quatermass, so Quatermass goes with him to the site. Breen thinks that the object is a V weapon. Oh, sorry, those were the German rockets that were fired on the UK. Right, during the Blitz. But Quatermass disagrees. Then another skull is found inside the object, meaning that the object itself must also be 5 million years old. The object itself is of an unknown metal, which Quatermass believes is alien in origin, but Roni's sure the skulls are terrestrial in nature. Right. Roni's assistant, Barbara Judd, mentions that Hob is an old name for the devil. Mm hmm. With one B. Because, yeah, well, because she's looking at the signs on the street, it says Hobbs End with two Bs, and then right underneath it she saw that it was a restoration sign, because originally it was just Hobbs with one B, and then that's where she mentioned that it's like, oh, wait, that was a Hob means devil? Well, it's not just devil, it, it can be any kind of imp or anything like that. We So we talked about, again, if you listened to our show, if you listened to the episode on The Hobbit, we talked about how, <laughs> how H-O-B... Or G-O-B, uh, there's a long history of creatures in Britain that go back to being called like these little kitchen devils or things like that. Hobbits, hobgoblin comes from it. Goblin comes from the same word. <laughs> Hob as a, a thing for the devil. Even Dobby from Harry Potter, the Harry Potter series uh, comes from this tradition. Even the boogeyman comes from the same bog, hob, bob, bog etymology. Anyway, they also like... In Adventure Time, they even mentioned Glob as their deity. So, H-O-B with one B or H-O-B with two Bs, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's sort of, you know, uh, been translated a whole bunch of different ways. But it usually refers to something like either the devil in particular or some sort of devil, demon, imp, small folk, dwarfish creature, troll-like thing, hobbit, goblin, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah, this movie would have been really different had it turned out to have been hobbits instead of uh, what we <laughs> find out later. <laughs> Bobby tells them about this abandoned house across the street, which is supposedly haunted. So they go there to investigate, and the police officer's immediately spooked and leaves. Yeah, because this is like a childhood place for him. Like, this was like his childhood neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And then meanwhile, a you know member of the bomb disposal team beholds a vision of Roni's ape man appearing through the wall of the object mm-hmm. while everybody else is off looking at this haunted house. Quatermass and Barbara find historical accounts in their research of uh, supernatural occurrences going back centuries, coinciding with disturbances of the ground around Hobbs End. Now, this is where the movie gets incredibly fascinating for me because I like that it approaches history and all the stuff that we know about ghosts and demons and all this. Like, I mean, cause back then, like that's how they could refer to things. And there's a line and I wrote it down because it was something that really stuck with me, which was, I like the notion that ghosts and demons were simply science that was badly observed. Yeah. And, uh, You know, there's a famous Arthur C. Clarke, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke quote that said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, I think is what he said, (laughs) something along those lines. So you can imagine, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like the old far side where this spaceship lands and two aliens come out and one of them holds up a butane lighter and shows the light, you know, it flicks the light and this little, you know, fire and it shows it to human modern day humans and they're all looking at each other is like okay 
they're not impressed. Now what are we going to do with 10,000 butane lighters? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> I missed the far side. <laughs> I don't know why my mind went there. Then a hole opens in the side of the thing and reveals the corpses of three-legged insectoid creatures with sort of like horned antenna type things. Mm-hmm. And an examination of the creature's physiology suggests they came from Mars. Now, it's fair to point out, these larvae are dead. Yeah. You know? They're just like uh, statue props. Yeah. But when they opened it, one of them lurched forward, and there's this sudden jump scare there, right? <laughs> yep. That was real. Apparently, nobody expected that to happen it wasn't supposed to fall forward. The prop just fell and that startled the actors and they kept it in the film. Perfect. So somehow they determined they come from Mars. I'm not sure how, how they decided that, but you know, Quatermass jumps to these conclusions and everybody just goes along with it all the time. Sure. Sounds great. Quatermass and Roni see a similarity between them and popular images of the devil, right? Cause they got these two horns. So they decide to go to the press And this really pisses off the government minister who didn't want this released. Yeah, so that that wasn't like the prime minister. That was just like a different minister? A minister, yeah. Okay, just a minister, not the prime minister. No, not the prime minister. There are a lot of ministers, right? So this is just another minister. I don't know which one he is. Okay. You know, maybe... Yeah, because I wrote down, I was like... After this was done, I was like, okay, who the heck was the prime minister at the time this was being filmed? Because... Damn, it seemed like they had it out for him, if that was the case. But it's not, so... Well, maybe... I don't know. Let, let's uh, let's consult online, just in case. Ah, yes. Yeah, the actor is Edwin Richfield, and he plays Minister. Okay. Minister of Defense. He's Minister oh, of okay. Defense. Okay. Okay. This is a classic Quartermass thing. It's like, they have, like... Facts A, B, and C, and he jumps to W, X, Y from that. He comes up with this hypothesis out of nowhere that the spaceship came from a dying Mars, and and since they were unable to survive on Earth due to the atmosphere, they sought to preserve their heritage by creating a colony, this proxy colony, by significantly enhancing the intelligence of these hominids and imparting Martian faculties to these indigenous creatures <laughs> using advanced medical and, and surgical techniques. And the descendants of these ape men evolved into humans, but retained the vestiges of Martian influence buried in their subconscious. Okay. So this is Quatermass's hypothesis <laughs> based on what we know so far. <laughs> now, this isn't the first time he's done this, right? Like, oh, clearly every, not. You know. In every movie, there's this moment where Quatermass comes up with this crazy, you know, oh, obviously the mud blob was caused, you know, is from, <laughs> you know, and it eats radiation and, you know, uh, okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> Breen, the colonel, the old, mm-hmm thinks this alien craft is actually a Nazi propaganda weapon. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, to sow fear in the British populace, you know, which actually makes a lot more sense. You know? it's, it makes a lot more sense, but at the same time, there's still a lot of like, boy, they made this thing with 5 million year old skulls to instill fear as a prop. There's, it seems plausible, but at the same time, it's just as unlikely. Given these two different hypotheses, the minister believes Breen and decides to unveil the spaceship at a press conference. <laughs> okay, meanwhile, there's this guy, Sladden, who is brought in to drill into it. Yeah. And while he's trying to do this, the drill just cannot puncture through this metal. And while he's trying to do this, he's overcome by a powerful psychic eminence. And his mind unleashes telekinetic energy, disrupting everything. He basically goes Dark Phoenix here for a second, you know, and like um, everything goes crazy. Might be the best Dark Phoenix movie we've seen. Mm, No, well, movie, but if, if we were going... A bit, you know, TV or anything like that. Oh, no, I'm, I'm clearly saying movie because the okay. animated show was much, was like perfect. 
Uh, I was going to say Stranger Things. Stranger Things is the Dark Phoenix saga. Or is anyway. that? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this worker is drilling in, gets these telekinetic... Everything goes crazy, and um, finally, like, ru- he runs out, and he ends up in this church where Judd and Quatermass find him. Mm-hmm. And he tells them that he saw this vision of hordes of insect creatures under this alien sky, and that he saw himself as one of them, and that he had to desperately run away in fear for his life. Honestly, this might have been one of my favorite scenes in the movie. When Quatermass proposes that all these ghosts and demons are just simply science that was observed badly. Now we're in a religious monastery. We are in, you know, we have the priest answers the door, says, uh, don't disturb this man. And all I could think of was how much were people thinking about possession at the time? And, oh, this guy's filled with demons. And it's literally a moment of science versus religion in a sense, where it's like you have one group of thought that is clinging to what they you know, believe in, what, what their faith is, and they aren't as likely to buy more modern science uh, observations and everything, which would in many ways disprove a lot of what they hold fundamental. But it's just it, it's a perfect moment where science that was observed badly is embraced and an example of what's going on with with everything in the modern technology it's just to, to see I, I don't know i just i really like that scene I, I i could have had that scene go on for a few more <laughs> minutes in the film i've been perfectly fine with it all right so maybe i brought in the phoenix reference too soon because they go back to <laughs> hobbs end with this machine that Roni has developed to uh map- I, I call it I call it the Ghostbusters machine because it kind of reminded me of that. Like when they put the thing on uh, Rick Moranis and you see like the projection of Zool on the monitor. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't. Yeah, if they got it from this. See this movie when they're making Ghostbusters. But to me, it reminded me a little bit of Cerebro from the X-Men. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so they bring back this machine and this redheaded assistant woman, Barbara, (laughs) with them, right, to this site. Right. It allows them to project on a screen the visions that someone's having in their their head. Mm -hmm. Barbara ends up under the spaceship's influence Mm -hmm. and goes telekinetic crazy. Using Roni's machine, they see these images of hordes of Martians (laughs) engaged in what he says is a genocidal race purge to cleanse the Martian hives of all the mutations. So, So, again... We're like cleansing the mutants. Did you get that at the time? Okay, so I'm like, you know, actually, it's funny because I remember was it when you were talking about what was going on, like at the time about uh, Notting Hill. I was like, oh god, that is oddly very timely. The reason I brought that up is that was one of Nigel Neal's inspirations for this. Huh. He was inspired by two things: the Mau Mau. Right. Purges, Mm -hmm. which I mentioned Mm -hmm. in Kenya, as well as the race riots in Notting Hill. That was one of the main inspirations for this. Anyway, these Martian hordes were engaging in this genocidal race purge to cleanse the Martian hives of all mutations. So the minister and Breen are just like, you know, this is that, that time where like, you can show them the the actual evidence and they go, um, you know, what was the guy from Ghostbusters that like Walter Peck Peck insists they yeah. shut down the uh, containment facility. <laughs> and the sad thing to think is Peck may have been right. If you think about it. Why? Well, because none of the stuff was registered with the EPA. None of the stuff was. You know, like, it, it, they all do have unlicensed nuclear accelerators, so there's no licensing or all that. I mean, yeah. I still love Ghostbusters, but that's just, like, one little thought of, oh, wait, there might be some legitimacy to what Walter Peck was raising questions about. <laughs> okay, so the so therefore, the, like, the containment facility should be shut down? And, oh, like, no, 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 all these- no, clearly not! <laughs> 
Speaking of disasters, a power line drops on the spaceship and gives it a massive jolt of electrical energy. And it um, affects the range <laughs> of the spaceship's influence on everybody. Yeah. Londoners that have this innate psychic ability that was put in them by the Martians. <laughs> and so then they go on this rampage to cleanse the hive, as it were, humans of those that don't have the psychic ability, right? Because they're the ones that don't fit with the hive, so to speak. I, I don't know if Neil's uh, inspiration was allowed to come out the way that he... Uh... Yeah, it may have been a little too touchy to do genocide on. I mean, it would have, absolutely, but... Well, this is the purge, right? Yeah. This is yeah, the, this the, is purge, the yeah. purge of its era, right? Yeah. They're literally trying to purge those that are different. And when I'm watching this whole sequence play out, I wondered what exactly made their targets mutants or imperfects or whatever. Like, did, did you get that impression watching the, the ending sequence? The imperfects were the ones that didn't have the psychic ability. Okay, okay. So it's, it's either they had the hive mentality or... Right. Yeah, gotcha. The ones that were part of the hive mentality are attacking all those that didn't have the hive mentality. Ah, okay. Thank you. And one of the people that falls under alien control is Quatermass himself. Mm-hmm. Colonel Breen is killed by the energy mm -hmm. or electricity or something from the ship. Yeah, Roni manages to snap Quatermass out of it. And then the two of them realize that a small portion of the population are immune, like Roni. Right. And then so as this psychic energy intensifies, streets and buildings are getting destroyed and a giant spectral image of a Martian, which looks like the devil, mm -hmm. appears over the city. And Roni, who is kind of like the true hero here, he recalls that there are stories about how the devil could be defeated by iron. <laughs> so he theorizes that the Martian energy can be discharged into the earth if he could find like a lightning rod for it. Find, find, a, gra find a grounding wire. Yeah. So Quatermass is trying to stop Barbara, who's like gone full Dark Phoenix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Roni, meanwhile, climbs this crane this building crane members construction site and yep. swings it into the spectral image because it's made of iron right and the which apparently was better than the uh either the radio show or the tv broadcast because apparently he just threw a chain in there oh and that was it <laughs> so you know as much as nigel neal complains about these hammer horror films i think the endings are better they made him cinematic like that ending is beautiful yeah yeah very much so. And not just this one, but also Creeping Unknown and Enemy from Space. Like, yeah. better endings. Yeah. So the crane bursts into flames and discharges all the energy. Mm -hmm. It kills Roni, but <laughs> the image disappears and Londoners return to normal. But not before Quatermass hits, hitting, hitting Barbara in the final confrontation there. <laughs> just having, like, a struggle or whatever on the ground, right? And he's trying to keep her away. Yes. In the end, it ends with the two of them standing in a completely devastated London. And credits. And then roll the credits, yeah. Yeah. And that ending was a little awkward for me because I'm so used to Quatermass having a wonderful final, like like Andy Rooney's final thoughts or whatever. Like he has like these great one-liners or moments to make <laughs> everything sink in. Don't you just... hate it when London is taken over by... <laughs> Don't you hate it when <laughs> alien force, alien uh, force trying to purge humanity and I hate way. it when that happens. <laughs> now, <laughs> it's been decades since I heard uh, Andy, Andy Rooney, Rooney, so I'm not sure how to do his voice, but that's that's what I remember. That's pretty from. close. That was pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they watch it. That's why they listen to this show for all the topical references. <laughs> Topical, yeah. <laughs> Let me say, just about that final thought, it's like, yeah. I think this is where I would have liked to have seen Brian Donlevy. Mm -hmm. Too old to play it, but person it, it like... Need, it needed a Donlevy moment at the end. A Donlevy type person would have had that final line. Yeah, and the funny thing is, is after everything I watched with Andrew Keir in the Quatermass role, 
I was waiting for that. He could have pulled it off. Like all the, like I mentioned, all those other scenes where he's talking about all the stuff in the past being science observed badly and the scene in the, the monastery, and even that scene that you were talking about where he's uh, snapped out of the hive mentality, and it's not through like a hit on the head or like the guy doesn't punch him or anything. He literally reminds Quatermass of his humanity and intelligence. And it's just a moment where he's like speaking to him. He's like, remember who you are. Remember you're a scientist. And that's what takes him out of the hive mentality. Again, another great scene. That's pure Nigel Neal. And this is why Nigel Neal actually liked this one best. I, in many ways, agree. There were sometimes the effects pulled me out of the film, like the early telekinesis scenes. I was like, I was surprised with the effects in the first couple because I wasn't ready for them. I wasn't expecting to see a pre-2001 shot in the first Quatermass experiment. And some of the model effects in Enemy from Space were phenomenal to look at. And so then when it gets to like the telepathic scenes, and I just start seeing like the fishing wires on the outside dragging everything up. I'm like, oh, really? We're doing this? And the, But then it gets to the finale. I'm like, okay, this is gorgeous. The fires are great. It, the giant creature in the city... Thankfully, not a blob. I was very relieved to not see a blob for the first time. <laughs> I was happy yeah. for that. Um, and the crane look was really well done. So, like, that that part was cool. I'm going to say my impression was actually not as uh, strong as Nigel Neal's and yours. <laughs> this is actually my least favorite of the, two, of the official Quatermass films. Of the 3.5. This is my least favorite because the ideas were there. Mm -hmm. The effects, like you said, didn't progress. They regressed. You know, so they were actually in some ways worse. And the gore. The gore wasn't there. Yeah, Yeah. that's another thing that it sorely needs. Yeah, the horror in general. I felt the tension was not there. No, no, it really wasn't. I was not on the edge of my seat like I was. In Enemy from Space, I'm like... All right, they could lose this at any minute. This could, you know... (laughs) Yeah, there was legitimate tension in Enemy from Space. That's my take on this. I enjoyed the ideas. I enjoyed the themes. I like the fact that, like, in the 60s, this type of topic of science versus religion was done so much better than it would have been done today. Like, today, it would have just been a lot more seething resentment on either side (laughs) but no it it was done in a very intelligent thoughtful thought-provoking manner i think i responded a lot to that but like you said like knowing that we're four films deep into the franchise what we've established we've established gore we've established tension we've established x ratings that was the other thing too x ratings like the first 2.5 i could understand the x ratings like the last one i was kind of like Okay, maybe, sure. But this last one, if it received an X rating from the British board, I almost want to look at him and go, okay, why? Yeah. Explain yourself. Well, I want to do that anyway, but yeah, okay. Yeah, Yeah, there's a lot they have to explain for. (laughs) Okay, well, let's just say that if you really liked this one best, you are not alone. Many people consider this one the best of the Quatermass films. I want to wrap it up and say that if you want to give us any feedback on this, you can email us at GC eight podcast. That's letter G letter C number eight podcast at gmail.com. Do us a big favor. Tell somebody about the show. If somebody's asking for something, uh, to listen to, or they're listening to all their podcasts and they are looking for a new podcast to listen to mention this show to them. And that's all we ask. All right. Until next time, this is Eric. And this is John. Signing off. But there are always complaints about the gunshots and the (laughs) stuff going on there. So, oh my God. (laughs) Anyway. um, All right. So, quarter mass in the pits.